Why Stand Staring? A Reflection for the Ascension. In the final paragraph of the first reading on this solemnity of the Ascension, we hear a question asked of the gathered disciples by messengers in white garments. Why are you standing there looking up at the sky? The two dazzlers deliver this question to rouse the disciples, seemingly immobilized by the otherworldly vision of Jesus' return to the Father. But the point of the story is not the absence of Jesus, but his enduring presence through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Only the Luke Acts evangelist includes the ascension as an event separated in time from the resurrection. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, read today, the departure scene takes place in the evening on the first day of the week, after the Emmaus-bound runaways return with the report of meeting Jesus on the road. He appears, shows them his hands and feet, and has a bite to eat. He explains, yet again, the scriptures and their fulfillment in his suffering, death, and resurrection, and calls them witnesses of these things. He promises to send power from on high and tells them to wait for it. Finally, he leads them out to Bethany, blesses them, and takes off, so to speak, for the heavenly realm. It all happens on the same day as the discovery of the empty tomb. In the beginning of Acts, also read today, as mentioned above, the same evangelist presents the same event as taking place 40 days after the resurrection. The number 40 rings with symbolic overtones. Noah in the ark, Israel, and then Jesus in the desert. It means something like when the time was fulfilled. Of course, Even with this extended period of instruction, the disciples still ask the wrong question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? His answer, it is not for you to know the times or seasons the Father has established by his own authority, sounds a lot like none of your business. Then he gives his final instruction. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The vision of the disciples as spirit-empowered witnesses links these two versions of the Ascension event together. Now the words of the messengers heard in the Ascension account from Acts make a bit more sense. Why are you standing there looking at the sky? A Dutch composer named Bernard Hybers wrote a wonderful round based on this text and Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Why stand staring at what has gone before? Don't get lost in things of the past. I, says he, will begin something new. It's beginning already. Haven't you heard? In other words, you've got your marching orders. You know what to do. Get a move on. For me, this echoes the story of the Transfiguration, when the disciples present wanted to build shrines and stay up on the mountain. Another song comes to mind. Tis good, Lord, to be here, yet we may not remain. 
But since you bid us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. The lectionary provides two options for the second reading this Sunday. The first one from Ephesians points to one aspect of power from on high, specifically the spirit of wisdom and revelation that brings knowledge of the Father of glory and an understanding of our call as disciples. The second option from Hebrews gives us an ascension after picture, placing Jesus Christ in the true sanctuary, appearing before God on our behalf. Because Jesus has opened for us a new and living way through the veil and into the heavenly sanctuary, we can approach God in prayer and worship with a sincere heart and in absolute trust. And then get going. Out the door and into the messy, wounded world, bringing the healing love of Christ to every situation. Ite misa est. You sent are.